I'll be able to download the video. Hey, Marquita. I'll be able to download the video right after. Okay. Yeah, and then we can um, house it on YouTube. We put the last one on YouTube as well, so it's already up there. Oh wow, I, I do remember you said something about YouTube. Uh, I just want to put it off. There, the Dion's here. Yep, she just joined, so you can get started anytime you're ready, sir. All right, I want to get the opportunity to join in. Uh, Glenn said sixty people on already. Yeah. I get, I'm getting a few texts from people saying that uh, trying to join in or join in there. And one person asks, "Can they, are they able to watch it later? Um, yeah, it'll be, Facebook it's know, it'll be ready later. Um, it, it'll be, I mean, it'll be ready immediately after this on your Facebook. And then tomorrow I'll upload it to YouTube. Thank you, Dion, uh, for joining. I'm not sure if you were on the, on the last call. Uh, that's what I hate using my phone when I'm doing Zooms because people see me and just use this opportunity to call me. Maybe thinking I'm on my computer, but I'm actually on my phone. <laughs> and so I had to text them from my other phone. But uh, for those who just joining, we just finished a very detailed, comprehensive call um in the cedar anacostia also called chopper city butler gardens area about the uh programming we're trying to do there they uh don't have a recreation center there even though we i put money in the budget um 2017 um we are building a rec there but even still we have experienced a number of violent crimes even while we were on the call um there was somebody put in the chat that there was gunfire going off even while we were on the call um, but Dion wanted to show you there. Uh, Rhonda and Karen was there. Um, and Wally giving feedback about different programmers. And Brother Jason uh, formed a, a group uh, in Cedar Gardens that's doing exceptionally well with some of the black boys there. And we are hopeful that we can collaborate and bring together some of the community leaders who are there that may not have an organization or a title, but have influence and have a vision to better their community. Um, and so I want to show you, Dion, that you, uh, your staff was there representing you well, and we look forward to following up. Also, uh, the health care, uh, now I want to say unity, but it wasn't unity. It was, um, what was it, Wanda? Uh, Mr. Preston. I'm sorry, it was unity health care. Unity health care? Yes. Okay. So he corrected me. Uh, joined in because we're trying to seek space. We also got buy-in from the D.C. Department of Recreation and Roving Leader Division can need shorter to ensure that even though there's no rec, that we're ensuring the fun wagon, the movie night, the fun, mo I mean, the, the skate mobile, the rock climbing are able to be there throughout the uh, summer months to ensure there's programming. But we have a lot of work to do on the front end uh, to ensure their safety because you don't want to bring all the young people and kids out doing skating and riding their bikes and, and, and they're opening fire on our babies. Um, so we have a lot of work to do between now and then. Um, there's also been some complaining around the laundromat area, the um, Go Hope Road Institute with the Methadone Clinic, um, the corner store on 16W, and some of these properties are in um, litigation with the D.C. Office of the Attorney General uh, to be cleared a nuisance property. So we have to get an update to update them on that. But We've been having some of these discussions, moving the needle from uh, just from talking about the problem to talking about the solution. And that is a good segue to where we are today. Uh, we know historically, um, I grew up in the nonprofit community working at ERCPCP, uh, formed my own nonprofit, helping inner city kids to see Hicks. And we've done a lot of work in various communities. Uh, in what he also did stuff in War 7, worked at Ben and Terrace as well, Simple City. Um, but we knew there's been a drought in coordination and collaboration and resources as relates to those individuals on the ground that have a heart to do this work 
and have a mission and business to do this work in various capacities in and out of schools and in our communities. Um, and so this is a conversation to draw together some of those collaborations again, Dion, with the Foster of these Family Strength and Collaborative and us in your mission and vision. Um, to get some grants into the community, some resources, not just government grants, private funding, um, philanthropic dollars, um, and just uh, resources to help people sustain and build their organization. Uh, because I hear it all the time, Trey, I want to start this, or I want to do this. Then I ask them, what have you done so far? And so most people stop there. And I often say that, you know, if no one's going to fulfill your vision but you. You know, you can have a great idea. And if you're waiting for somebody else to fulfill your vision, you're going to be waiting a long time. And I know that we all have to help each other and build bridges for each other. And that's what we're attempting to do tonight. Um, but this is also a follow up because we want to get these voices to the city council and to the mayor. Because while I, Treyon White, represent Ward 8 in the D.C. City Council, there's six other individuals that represent Ward 8 um, in, in politics and in government. And we have four at-large members. And we have a chairman um, and we have myself and, and including Mayor Bowser. And so uh, I, I cannot settle for the narrative that we don't have the money or we're experiencing budget cuts. I know for a fact that in the last four years, we had surpluses in the budget. This year, we had a $500 million surplus during a pandemic just this year alone. The budget increased from when I got to the council in 2017 from 14.5 billion now to 17 billion. We have a triple A bond rating and our budget is healthy. We, we are taking hits. I do want to acknowledge that because the, uh, the restaurant and hotel industry that we are in the DC, which we generate a lot of tax, re tax revenues, but it's been certified from the chief financial officer just last week that we didn't take the hit that we expect to get. So we want to utilize some of that momentum to uh, put resources into the community and get people um, active it, it, as young as our babies. Because while we target and work with some high risk individuals, those young people were 12 before, 10 years old before, eight years old before. And some people in their families may be connected to government agencies and service services and not just not coordinated. And so what we want to do is not just drill on what the problems are, but figure out ways to empower people to become a part of the solution. Um, Wanda, are we ready to get y'all started? What did yes, I sir, we are yes sir we are ready to get started okay is everyone in um we have 102 people in oh well shoot. <laughs> I, just, I, little, I just started my rants you already laughing laughing in action uh, cool let me go to the agenda real quick if you're watching this please do not call me i, I want to just get a disclaimer but if you call me you'll interrupt what we're trying to do text me it's, it's better if you just text me thank you um, thank you. Um, so we want to start uh, with one of our community partners uh, who's been in this work since I've been in this work. And I'm, I, I consider myself young, young, you know, I got to say that. So, so Dion, you consider the old head in the, in the game. Uh, yes, in the nonprofit world. Welcome back. Thank you, sir. Well, uh, I would be remiss if I would not say, oh, hey, oh, my God. <laughs> and I haven't even dyed my hair in about five weeks. I promise you I have. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, honestly, I take that as a compliment, to be honest with you, honestly, uh, coming from you, council member, such a a progressive leader that we have and you um, even looking at me with that much respect. Actually, you know, I, I guess I am an old head when it comes to doing a grassroots organizing and community building level work. Um, but I'm a newbie as an executive. You know, nothing like our brother Glenn over there. He's been at this thing for a while and I thought that he loved me more than he did because he didn't tell me <laughs> that I should have I should have remained in a different seat. No joke. I'm joking. Um, I feel great. You know, this is my 50th year of life, so I feel like it's time for me to be completely selfless about how we uh, see opportunities because I think that God willing, if I'm able to have this kind of strength, I have less years ahead of me than I do behind me. So the first Southeast Collaborative has given me the awesome opportunity to do what they've done consistently for 25 years. 
and that's seed resources in the community and build opportunities for people who probably don't get to be right at the table. Um, so that doesn't mean that you sit them at the back seat at the table for far southeast. That means you widen the table and pull a seat up. So capacity building, mini grant work is not something new to this organization. But what I I want to I want to speak to because council member, I was a little taken back in terms of how you want us to do this. But I would love to have another opportunity to be more um, in depth and be able to stay longer. Um, but I did have something else that I was attending to, so I apologize. But Nikita Beans is going to be on to follow up. She is our special projects coordinator. And if you haven't worked with Nikita, you have done yourself a disservice. She's a dynamic young person and she follows through on what you ask her to do. So she'll be on this call to follow up with questions for, for Far Southeast Collaborative. But I want to take, um, I think I have 10 minutes and I've used about three of them acting like Glenn, like an OG and, and introducing yourself and laughing. But I'm going to really try to just say four things and we can build upon what that looks like for organizations. One, you said uh, building bridges, uh, council member. I think if, if you ask me how I feel about where the collaborative is and building bridges, is that's the core of the work that we do. However, it's harder to build bridges when we're all not connected, if that makes sense to anyone. So you can't expect the collaborative to build the bridge, but no one stands alongside so that others can walk past. So when you look at opportunities that you get at the collaboratives, know that every 92, and, I, and I'm saying this with no happiness, but 92% of our resources come from local funding. That's a poor formula for success. So because that's a poor formula for success, we are forced to figure out a way to help smaller organizations. But you have to stand aligned with us so we can continue to get the resources. What does that mean? And these are when I come, become 50 years old. These are the three points on that, and then I'm going to pass the mic. Um, you have to stay connected. You cannot assume that it's your responsibility to go to our funder and complain to us if you want the money to funnel downward. You have to understand that if the collaborative, like an organization ours, we miss it, you don't get angry with us because we missed it this time. You stand alongside, help us advocate for more resources, but keep our conversations with each other. That's how we stay connected. I'm hoping that the council member gives us an opportunity to funnel through a group of nonprofits like this and maybe he not be at it, that we can speak freely about how we do this work and stay connected instead of complaining. That's how you build bridges. You have to be accountable. It's not okay for you to get a grant opportunity and not spend the money appropriately. It is no excuse because we're in COVID or a pandemic. That's not an excuse anymore. We are African American and brown people are the most creative and talented people on the face of the earth. I'm not calling anyone else out. I think other races have awesome, awesome, and we as a people have awesome creativity. However, I'm speaking from the perspective of my life, not to offend anyone and the growth that I've seen in Ward 8. We have some of the most talented, creative people in this city. We need to be the most talented and creative people in a pandemic. You have to figure out how to stay connected and stay six feet apart until we get this thing under control. You have to build an innovative virtual platform that keep people connected. Think of what young people are drawn to. So you make sure that you stay accountable even with your $5,000. My last point is, this is the first point. You have to develop a strategic plan. No one is successful. I'm going to tell you the five P's I learned in college. I use it today. Prior planning prevents poor performance. You cannot ask for $50,000 and you have no track record of success. I want to know if you got $1,000, you were able to help somebody and the reason why you were able to do it. Let me help you build a structure to be able to articulate what that curriculum looks like. But you can't come to me wanting a salary because most of us started off this work by creating a strategic plan that built a salary in it for us. So again, council member, thank you for the opportunity. If you're looking at doing this work effectively, the council member said, how do we build bridges? First, stay connected, be accountable. If you have a problem with me, get to me and let's talk this thing out. We're learning this together. Nobody's perfect. You don't involve our council member in our nonprofit business unless we're doing it inappropriately. Give us an opportunity to fix this thing. 
Because when we look disconnected, we're not going to get the resources. Be accountable with the dollars you get. So you get spend it right. You can't build a salary off a five thousand dollar grant or even a fifty. You may you may create a percentage, but not the whole deal. And Thank last thing, you have to plan. And I think that's my ten minutes. I'm sorry, did I overtook my time? No, I know you. I feel like you're trying to close. Uh, I wasn't. I wasn't trying to close. I was trying to tell you the points that you, whatever you wanted me to ask the question. But those are the points for me as we build capacity. That's the way we're doing our work. So I, we have a capacity building opportunity that's going to be on the street. We're going to actually put that out. Nikita's going to give you guys the format of how that's going to be done. We're reaching out to organizations throughout the ward to do a mini grant from three thousand to five thousand dollars. But we're going to have a capacity building infrastructure program that's going to teach you these principles and give you the infrastructure like what Glenn does at this organization in Ward 8 using these resources to build your capacity to get larger resources. We're not going to do more work with people that, that, that are not accountable. And I just wanted to make sure I said that, Councilman. Thank you. I'll leave it there. I hope uh, I wasn't too aggressive. I do want to give the opportunity this time around for people in the audience to ask questions to you before we go to our next uh, speaker, which is be Glenn Ogilvie um, from the Center for Nonprofit Advancement. And if you are a nonprofit and or trying to establish a nonprofit stand, status, please put your information in the chat, uh, name, organization, email, and number so we can follow up and keep this conversation going and stay in communication because the, the hope is to make sure you get plugged in with these resources. You can build and grow your organization and get the skills and technical assistance to be effective in the work that you are doing or attempting to do. Um, so we'll take questions. Jules, if you can look at the Facebook to see uh, what questions are coming from the community yes. uh, so we can ask it so Dion can um, answer it. Uh, I actually have one ready if you if you're ready now. I am. OK, uh, the question is, we need some asset mapping for the ward. Who is serving? Who are they serving and what services are they providing? So one of the things that we're going to be would like to do with you is Nikita Baines is on this. Let's have you done an asset mapping project at all. Are you familiar with that? Have you done one? You ask the person if they have. Oh, okay. So I'll ask them, Dion. Because if she has, I would like to speak with her. We can set up a time. We've done an asset mapping some years ago, but you're absolutely right. I think Glenn and I can probably have a discussion around how we fund that. Um, but I think you're absolutely right. You're on point. And that's something I would like to co sponsor with you so that we can do something up to date for the council member and the board. That's an easy fix. These are the kind of these are the kind of questions I like. They're easy. Because we can do this. This is our work. I'll make sure to send them your email so they can reach okay, out to you. Send it to, send it to Nikita Baines and she'll connect it into the right resource. Awesome. I'm sure she's putting her information in the chat. Councilman, you also have two hands raised in the meeting. That's... Well, if you see them, you can just call on them because I, I, I can't see them. Okay. Gary Hill is the first one and Annette Preston will be second. Gary Hill. Going once, going twice. All right. Lynette uh, Preston. I don't even see him on the screen, Wanda, to be able That's to speak. It. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. You guys hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, so first, before I ask my question, um, Ms. Dion, and I'm gonna call you Ms. Dion because I've known you since I was in high school. Um, <laughs> you seem old, but you ran a program when I was at Banneker for college prep. I've never <laughs> forgotten your program or the impact that you had on me. Thank you. I was like 14. Yes, I still remember. Yes, Thank I you. seem old, though. <laughs> so, <laughs> and my second question is, um, I know that Far Southeast has so many resources, but I do find it difficult to um, figure out what those resources are. So like, what's the best way to um, to just know what you guys have to offer as um, as we as we move forward, as we try to? Because there are some people um, like I have a nonprofit. I've never had a grant before, but, um, you know, I'm at that place. So how do I. 
how do I tap into the, the resources that you all have? So you know what we're going to do? So it's, I know exactly who you are. I remember you. I was actually just talking about, I used to call it, you guys, the Yes, You Can Power to Succeed college yes. prep program. Yes. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Right. That was, that's, thank you so very much for doing that. Um, so the second thing is, you know, we, we recently got some resources, council member. We're going to split those dollars up into some small mini, mini grants. And we're going to do a capacity building program. And I'm hoping, again, I'm going to lean on my brother, Glenn. And we're going to offer it for free, Glenn. And we're going to make sure that as many people can get on this Zoom because we want to help you guys really build your foundation. We're going to offer this this spring um, and we're going to we're going to make this happen. And then at the end of that, um, based on your uh, attentiveness or what you've learned in the program, we're going to offer you guys some small grants to figure out how we do this work to keep you all engaged. So that's that's just what we're going to do. Um, and Nikita, I know I'm putting a lot on you, young lady. God bless you. I hope um, Jules help you with getting this information to you. So whoever gets on, we'll connect you, and we're going to offer this program this spring because I think this is imperative. Um, council member, thank you. We need to do this. This is what kind of taught Lynn and I how to make this stuff happen. So we're going to offer that this spring. We have our word come April. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Make, I'll make a note of that. No problem. Put your information in the chat. Oh, it's in there already. Okay. We'll, we'll make it happen. All right. You should be able to speak now. Okay. Council member, that's all I have. Thank you so very much, sir. I appreciate you for giving me the chance to speak. I hope this was good information, council member. Yeah, thank you. Uh, someone else just chimed in. Thank you, Dion. Who was that that just spoke? That was me and Dion as well. Glenn. Oh, okay. Apologies. Mr. Hill, are you there? I no longer see him, council member. I see him. Okay. All right. We're going to move on. Uh, now we will hear from uh, Glenn Ogilvie from the Center for Nonprofit Advancement. Go right ahead, Glenn. Thank you, council member. Can you, can you hear me okay? Yeah, perfect. Making sure the technology is, is up to par. I want to thank Dion as well um, for being so selfless in the work. Uh, we've worked together for a very long time. Um, I appreciate her, and I'm going to say that I trust her. And the reason I'm going to say trust is because that's a word that's going to be necessary for us as we move this sector forward, building trust with each other. And I think Dion touched on some of that trust as she talked about how um, – we come together as organizations and raise funds together and hold each other accountable and sort of trust that network. So I want to thank you, Councilmember White, uh, Wanda, the whole team for hosting this. Uh, I think this is very exciting. This is now uh, uh, All Things Nonprofit Part 2. Anything with the word nonprofit I think is huge uh, because as organizations and those of us doing the work know, we stand in the gap. And by that I mean we are in the spaces where government can't necessarily always support uh, corporations and other entities cannot. We're in the gap supporting community and making sure that our people and our communities are well. Uh, so again, my name is Glenn Ogilvie and I'm CEO at the Center for Nonprofit Advancement. You know, I had a lot of thinking before coming to have this conversation today and realized the best way to have it was to really hear from people in the room or around the Zoom what it is that they wanted to spend time discussing, where we would be best suited to serve the most people. So I thought we could use the chat as well to have people maybe just drop in some of the topics and things they want to take away from this evening's discussion. I'm happy to go through the chat and touch on some of those things after sharing some of the points that I think are really important. Um, the one that I want to touch on are a few key things, and these are phrases and things that I hear all the time as I sort of move through this pandemic. Um, one is that it's important for us to plan for war at a time of peace. And when I say plan for war at a time of peace, it really speaks to me that when we are in the height of a pandemic, we have, uh, will need to have already been ready uh, because that the rate at which the pandemic is ravaging our communities, we're needing to be solid organizations with our ducks in a row so we can compete for the resources necessary to come to the aid of our community members, uh, our residents. Uh, if we are, are not ready, um, it's going to take some time to get the resources we need to get ready. On average, when applying for funds from a foundation, it could be four to six months uh, when there's not a crisis. And that's the time to submit the proposal 
by their deadline uh, to wait for their review process and their board meeting to receive the award letter and then ultimately the check and to have that clear uh, the account of your organization. So plan for war at a time of peace. The other thing is something that my wife continues to say here recently, and I'm going to give her attribution until I forget and I'll claim it to be my own. But she suggests that we have to lift as we climb. Lift as we climb really is supporting each other, goes back to the trust, making sure that we're working together and bringing others forward so collectively we can have a greater impact uh, in the work. So I'm gonna start or, or move forward by talking about what it means to be a nonprofit, a little bit about how you start an organization and then move through to current day for what's happening at the Center for Nonprofit Advancement, how we're responding and some of our partners, Far Southeast Family Strengthening Collaborative and others are responding to this dual pandemic. Uh, I did hear um, a lot around starting a nonprofit. And what I would say is that this is probably a stronger time to partner and collaborate with existing organizations and individuals that have already started uh, to trust each other, to bring new programming to bear, uh, to collaboratively raise money uh, from organizations that otherwise wouldn't fund uh, one of us, but maybe coming together as two entities uh, to raise dollars in order to get things done. So searching and seeing who is out there uh, what the programming is, what needs exist, and how you, in your unique way, can respond to that need uh, would be really strong. I know my good friend Manon Matchett is on here, and, and when she was on last week, she asked the question, you know, are you an organization or a program? Uh, a lot of times we're a program, um, because to be an organization is very complex and complicated, and not having all of the infrastructure can challenge us. Um, I'm going to touch on that infrastructure really quickly and then do a time check. Uh, so to be an organization, we have a finance office, we're doing good financial management. Uh, we have a fundraising team, we have a board of directors that's functional. Uh, articles of incorporation and bylaws, we have that strategic plan uh, that Dion mentioned. We have all of the things that an investor or funder would ask for before deciding whether or not to give us resources. We have um, demonstrated outcomes, data that shows how well we do and the uh, inputs that we put forward and the outcomes we realize. So being an organization is difficult. And if we are that, uh, fantastic. If there are others who are wanting to start up that we can support even better and a better way um, to move forward. Really quickly, and then I'm gonna do a, a time check as well. Um, we want to make sure that fundraising is key. Uh, no money, no mission. And when we look to our core for fundraising, and the council member touched on this early on, it's, it's not just foundations, it's not just the one grant, but there are also corporations out there and individuals who can help support our work. Um, there's government funding, uh, obviously, which is what we're talking about today, but there's also earned income, ways in which we can generate revenue, uh, providing goods and services for a fee to those who can afford it and using those resources to subsidize and provide services for those who cannot. So I'm going to pause and do a quick time check before going any further to see where we are. Go ahead. Keep going, Glenn. We're good. Okay, good. So I want to talk a little bit about this dual pandemic. Um, someone mentioned the notion of um, doing an assessment or doing some mapping. Awesome. We want to know which organizations are out there because that can also help us to identify partners to collaborate with to get things done, to know who we can refer people to um, for things that are outside of the scope of our organization. The one thing that has been um, uncovered, and we at the Center for Nonprofit Advancement commissioned some data to understand where things were with the pandemic and how it was impacting organizations. We realized that um, 55, 60% of our organizations experienced a drastic loss in revenue at a time where they're seeing double and triple the amounts of need. Uh, so more people coming to those organizations for service um, at a time where they've, lose, they've lost uh, large portions of their revenue. So again, we're being challenged to do more with less, the same way that we were challenged during the Great Recession. When we looked a little bit deeper from a race equity standpoint, uh, we realized that organizations led by people of color, black leaders in most cases, were heavily underfunded and have been over many years. Um, the 2019 study by Washington Regional Association of Grant Makers uh, uncovered as they responded, those who responded to the question, that less than 3% of all of the funding that went to organizations in our region 
went to organizations led by people of color. So less than 3% of all of those resources. What that has showed us is that organizations led by people of color are two or three times more likely to fail during the pandemic. They were more likely to lay people off and to uh, un and share or sort of uh, implement furloughs. Uh, last data point, um, we understand that um, a third of our nonprofits stand a chance nationally to go out of business by the time the, the uh, pandemic is over. So without intervention, a third of our organizations will go out of business. So that's the war I refer to when I say plan for war during a time of peace uh, and making sure that we're strong as organizations and able to, um, to relate and respond. So two things at the center, and I'm gonna go see what we have in the chat. One, uh, we're committed, uh, Dion mentioned it, um, selfless as well to respond to what we now know is this new reality. Uh, we launched what we're calling a sector rebuilding campaign to support organizations to not be a part of that third that's going out of business to be as strong as they can. We're providing crisis management technical assistance, individualized to help organizations understand how they can reorganize, um, raise dollars in ways that they haven't necessarily in the past and stabilize to get through this. This is a three-year initiative because we know it will not end in the near term. Uh, we're also providing fundraising support, uh, helping organizations to develop what could be a standard and strong common grant proposal. Uh, the common grant application is something that Washington Regional Association of Grant Makers developed a long time ago. One common application that many foundations accept. If you have a strong common grant application, you can share that with a number of different organizations as you uh, search for resources to build your organization. We're bringing people together. We're introducing organizations and helping to spark collaboration. We're sharing data. Um, and we're also conducting these individualized organization assessments to go through a, an inventory to understand where you are and where the opportunities are for strengthening and then providing uh, individualized capacity building plans to build the capacity of each organization. So I'm going to be um, really excited um, to collaborate with Dion uh, yet again and to provide these opportunities. I'm delighted that so many people are on this evening. Uh, it means a lot to see that we're, we're so uh, interested in, in being strong mm -hmm. that even at 8 p.m. Uh, we can have over 100 people um, looking for new resources and opportunities. So without cost, we're doing that. Last piece at the center. After George Floyd and all of the unrest, we decided to look into organizations, not just nonprofits, but corporations and government agencies as well, to understand where we were from a racial equity uh, standpoint and whether or not there were opportunities to get stronger in the way that we allow all people to join and all people to grow. So we launched a new Center for Race, Equity, Justice and Inclusion, which is very active. Uh, we'll see more about that on our website. You'll also see how to start a nonprofit there as well, if that is definitely your interest. And I also uh, put my information into the chat and look forward to working with uh, anyone here who's interested in more mm -hmm. info and some one-on-one -on -one, uh, attention as well. Thank you, Glenn. I see we have a number of organizations putting that information into the chat. If you can collect that information as well, Glenn, and save them in your database because we want to follow up with these organizations at a later date. Um, I, I want to share something and I want to get your expertise on this. Um, I see also we have Mr. Randolph here as well. Thank you and welcome. Um, for me, as early on as a younger man, you remember those days when I started a nonprofit just trying to do some work in the community. First, I started doing programming um, before I was a official nonprofit, right? Because I saw the need. I, I used to coach Little League football and I saw that coaching football was not the end all be all solution to addressing the critical needs of these young black boys I kept seeing. I break four in two years, all under the age of 17. First out with J Rock, James Richardson, Michael Sims, you're talking about um Omar, uh Devin Folks, all in all in it, two years, all under the age of 16, actually we're in high school, 10th grade. Um, and so uh, what I do know is, as you said, is this a, a program or organization? And at the beginning, I was doing programs. Uh, I had them a group. I partnered with uh, recreation centers, community centers, uh, churches to use their facility because I didn't have any money to own a building. Right. And so I had to transition to uh, getting grants, payroll, uh, taxes. 
um, actually putting together a program on paper just from the beginning to the end of what that looks like. What do you say, Glenn, to someone who just have a program but looking to grow that program to something uh, more official to receive uh, government funding and for the ability to grow? Councilman no White, thank you for sharing that. And you're right on target. It always starts as a program. Every nonprofit started with one person who was passionate about an issue or a cause and wanted to do something about it. And they didn't wait until they had a 501c3 or other uh, credentials to do that work. They started doing the work. So as you mentioned, getting the work done, having data and outcomes to prove that it was effective, but then evolving to um, bring forward the tax status and some of the other pieces that would make you an organization. For those of us who are operating right now, um, because of where we are, if you want to get started in a more formal way so that you can receive funds, I would recommend fiscal sponsorship. I would recommend getting together mm -hmm. with a nonprofit that would allow you to be a program under their umbrella. We're going back to that trust, and I know it's challenging. Under their umbrella, under their umbrella rather, that organization would receive the funds and then shift them to your program so you can have the operating resources that you need. So fiscal sponsorship, really important in that regard. The other thing is many of us are able to um, run those programs uh, and be effective and quickly organize and start a nonprofit. And I'm gonna to shift to something I saw in the chat here, how do I start an organization? Um, there's a very quick, rapid process. The IRS made it easier now about two years ago. You're filing a form 1023 it used to take nine and sometimes 10 or so months. Now it can happen in three weeks. There's a form 1023EZ, the two letters. Um, it's a shorter form. You pay your resources and you submit. And as long as you have a charitable purpose, which they will approve, as long as you have three board members and um, you're organized in that regard, you can get your tax exempt status. And that's after going to DCRA and you know, developing the corporation, et cetera. So you can get going very quickly. I will say with 1023EZ, you are suggesting that you will not raise more than $50,000 in your first year. So that's another difference between the short and the long form. Um, I saw one more thing here that I'll, I'll touch on briefly uh, and then stop. This chat is uh, very active and, and moving quickly. Um, it looks like it's already gone. So I'll, I'll pause once more. Oh, okay, I see it here, I'm sorry. So the question was, um, what is required of us uh, after, before and after we get funding? So you apply for this funding, competitive process. Not every organization receives resources. You receive those dollars. You are required by signing that grant agreement and saying that you're gonna do the work that you propose to get that work done. Um, with those dollars, you're uh, in most cases required to submit an interim report and a final report. Um, if you're really on it, you'll have great data that proves that you were effective with those dollars and then you will get those funds again. I call those one-time grants go away money uh, because you might get a couple dollars and never see it again. But if you're able to secure funds on an annual basis year over year, now you have one solid relationship, build a few others and before you know it, you are a million dollar organization with employees doing great work and being well known. So I'll pause there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, real quick, what I often see is that those who start out to get funding, um, as you know, uh, funding sources in, even priorities for funding sources in. So you may get a grant to do this, this, and this. And you engage a population of people, individuals, or children, or kids to your program, right? And you walk them through this process, but the grant fund ends. And a lot of times organizations get stuck there. Um, what do you suggest as far as trying to diversify and strengthen your, because I know one of the things uh, I found out was there were uh, organizations that did capacity building and put as exec directors with other exec directors and they helped formalize fundraisers and, and, uh, and diversity, diversity of fundraising with grant writers. What do you suggest to those organizations who may start off getting seed funding, but get stuck? And the second part is that some people who don't have a strong mission and vision would change the structure of their organization every couple of months to fit funding formulas. What do you suggest for that as well? Yeah, I appreciate that. So starting from the back, mission creep is, is, is difficult because it prevents funders from taking you seriously as an organization. 
Um, we know that we're good at a core area, which would be our mission, uh, but we can't be good at everything and, and do it in a way that has outcomes that are meaningful. Uh, so focusing on your mission and waiting for funds or finding funds that fit your cause is the better way to go. And that's prospect research. Uh, Candid, which used to be called the Foundation Center, uh, now still provides a database that allows you to put in your mission and the work you do and see a drop down for who funds that work, which funders are within that same area and scope. So that prospect research is important. Can you um, say again? You say Candid, can you give us the site? Sure. Um, I think they are candid.org. It's the merger that happened between the Foundation Center and GuideStar. New name is Candid. Uh, but they still have that database that allows you to search for funds uh, and do prospect research. So I believe it is Candid, C-A-N-D-I-D.org. Um, when you get that one round of funding, to answer that piece of the question, we've got to do two things at once. One, we've got to continue raising dollars using the money we receive to leverage other money because now we're verified, if you would. We've got, you know, call it a virtual a blue check. And some funders will give you funding just because one of their peer funding organizations did because they, they now know that you're doing something right, you're organized. So when you get that first um, breakthrough grant, you want to use that and write about that and share that with other funders to see if you can use it to leverage other resources. Um, one more trick of the trade, a tip here. Sometimes when you get that one grant, it's helpful to ask that entity that's providing you the resources to make some or all of it a match. And what that means is a $20,000 grant from one entity with 10,000 of it being a match gives you a reason to have conversations with many others and for them to believe that their investment of 10K will be doubled uh, because you already have the match that you can only access if you receive their funds. So lots of strategy and creativity in bringing these dollars forward. Thank you. Uh, I know one of the other struggles I had was board development. I see that in the comment as well. I started off with my cousin, myself, and my ex-wife. That was, that was the three uh, in starting an organization. And it eventually evolved into someone from Bank of America, uh, William Lockers from the State Board of Education. We had all these different people with expertise and different fields we wanted to go in, but it was just us at the beginning. Uh, what's your uh, comment or suggestion about uh, board strategy? Touch on that, and I think that's important. And I see a question here about whether or not nonprofits uh, should have a grant writing or a seeking team. Um, so, you have to have three board members at a minimum as you start when you file that form to get your tax exemption. For most of us, the first three people, and it goes back to that word trust, are going to be three people that we trust. Um, once we file and receive that tax exemption, we're now a charitable organization. Um, it's uh, not our organization. We don't own it. We're the founder who helped to create the idea that got it going. Uh, but we then began to bring in more board members who are not necessarily people who are tied to us pretty closely, but people who bring skill sets and expertise to help us advance as an organization. Differing personalities, um, some pessimistic, maybe some optimistic, it all helps because you're creating a space where you can test and challenge ideas in the way forward, which helps you uh, as you get further into the community. Um, so you want a board member who knows finance, it's an accountant in most cases, you want a board member who knows legal, uh, maybe an attorney uh, coming forward, someone who knows fundraising, super important. These are things that attorney keeps you out of trouble, fundraiser brings you the resources, finance makes certain that you manage the resources efficiently and effectively. So those are three skills right up front. And then you want people who understand the mission uh, that can help you strategize on how best to put forward programming that really makes a difference in the mission area. Board members are ambassadors. They're supposed to help open doors for you. Uh, we do recognize that they are also volunteers and that their primary role is to partner with the executive director of the organization when you get to a point where you hire that person and um, make sure that they are also pushing that individual, managing him or her to be the best that they can be in leading the operations of the organization. Um, quickly on the, uh, the fundraising team, absolutely. And going back to the board, you have working boards at the beginning before you have governing boards. Working board means that accountant is actually doing the financial statements and the fundraiser is actually fundraising. 
but building a team of people who can raise funds to get you into those five key areas of bringing in resources, foundations, government, individuals, earned income as well as corporations is, is key. And to your point, uh, Councilmember White, that helps you to be diverse in your revenue streams so that if one area dries up, you are still able to operate and, and move forward. Thank you. We'll take additional questions. And I, if, I remember when I first uh, got diversified my board, I was in Bank of America. At that time, it was the Bank of America on South Capitol Street. And that's the bank I used to open up my account. I always had a meeting with the manager because there was always something going on with the bank and these fees, right? And so I just said, let me just ask. I said, I, you know, I come in often. I run a nonprofit organization. Are you interested in being on my board? And she was like, um... Uh, sure. And I was like, hey, <laughs> well, I'm, I, I had some documents already prepared in my, in, my, in, my, uh, in my car. So I ran out to the car and got it and showed her some of the things we were working on and it helped her to buy into the vision. And sometimes you just got to ask people. Just you got to uh, gotta be bold. You just got to ask. The worst thing you can get is a no. And the more you knock, the more doors will open. And people, and real, you know, they have a saying, we say real recognize real, but a genuine heart recognizes a genuine heart. So sure. if you're doing great work and service, and so you just got to start asking. Um, and you got to know what you're looking for. Uh, one of the things also I wanted to ask you um, before we get to Brother Randolph was about setting budget expectations. One of the things I knew in doing a nonprofit, how much I needed to do programming throughout the year. Right. Um, because I've done it so long. I know if I work in this community, it's going to take this amount of money. I know I needed an accountant to do my taxes in the, the year. My staff, I know I need, I, I'm doing three programs in two different communities. I know how much the cost that is. I know how much the fringe is and so on and so forth. Right. Um, how do you, what do you suggest to organizations that's getting started trying to create a budget to get that funded? Um, what's your thoughts on that? Very helpful and very important. Um, so start, start small and really challenge yourself to identify every single thing that's going to cost money uh, in order to operate and don't leave out your time uh, the time of the individuals oftentimes we build these elaborate budgets and we can get to put salary in and we just say oh i'm going to make it well your day job is not going to allow you to make it so let's have the full budget down to the dimes um the last decimal for what's necessary to run the organization so you want to think about transportation, you want to think about supplies, you want to think about um, meals, if you're providing that for young people, maybe it's a youth serving organization, everything necessary to run. And you want to have actual costs um, to build this budget that may, in some cases, quickly balloon up over three hundred dollars or $500,000. Then you want to tell yourself or ask yourself, how many people does this budget support? If for $500,000, you're able to support 100 people over the 12 month period, and that's important too, the budget is over 12 months, a one year um, service budget, then um, that's helpful to note. And now try to understand the individual cost. What does it cost you to serve one person? Uh, and that's important and helpful because as you go to raise money and someone says, I can give you $200, you wanna be able to tell them what that $200 did uh, for your outcomes and how it contributed so that they can feel good to give you uh, ultimately uh, $400, 500 and even 20,000. So you wanna cultivate individuals to give you more resources, but build that budget um, really strong. I like to say the best way or the best thing for an organization that's having trouble raising money is one that's, having, that's able to save money. So if you're not bringing it on the revenue side, you can cut it on the expense side and that could be with volunteers it could be with in-kind contributions of some of that stuff that otherwise would cost you money uh, that will allow you to run. But always know uh, the true cost uh, of doing business for your organization. Thank you, Glenn. Uh, we're going to shift. To, if you can go through the questions and answers, part of this, we're going to come back to you after we hear from uh, Mr. Randolph uh, from the D.C. Auction Managed Commission. I saw a quick story. I saw David Miller in the chat. Um, I used to do programs with, with, with black boys, and one of the curriculums I researched was Dare to Be a King, right? And I met this gentleman, and he was telling me he could do curriculums. I was like, what's the name of your curriculum, right? And I'm like, he's like, Dare to Be a King. I'm like, this guy, I know a guy who does that, but I think at the time he lived in Philly. I'm like, he lives in Philly. He's like, no, I'm that guy. I'm like, where do you live? 
He said, I live in D.C. I said, where? Ward 8. I'm like, what? You know, and so the world is smaller than you know. And um, and I think that's, I hope that's the David I'm talking about on this chat, but I think it's him. I don't know. Maybe I'm right. Maybe I'm wrong. But go through those comments if you can. So we come answer some of those questions for some of those who may have questions. I didn't want to prolong Mr. Randolph uh, speaking. Go right ahead, Mr. Randolph. Welcome to the, to the Zoom call, All Things Nonprofit. Thank you, Councilmember White. I uh, appreciate it and glad to be here. Uh, and uh, thank you, Ms. Lockridge, for putting this together and getting all the logistics set up. Uh, let me do so. I had a screen share here. Give me two seconds, and you should be able to screen share in just two seconds. I thought I had you ready. If you want to go ahead and start conversation. All right. While well, you're going to. So I'm with, my name is Ali Randolph. I'm with the D.C. Commission on the Arts and Humanities. And we are an agency that provides grants, programs, and educational activities uh, to uh, constituents in D.C. Uh, and I'm going to talk about specifically is an opportunity, uh, a grant for Ward uh, East of the River, uh, Ward 7 and 8, uh, more specifically Ward 8 here. Uh, you should have access now. Okay, let me check it here. Got it. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, I think everybody can see here. All right. All right, and so that grant is called our EOR grant and uh, it was started 22 years ago uh, by uh, Marion Barry, and uh, and it was started with the uh, goals that we have up here now. It was to provide arts and humanities experiences for all the uh, residents of, who had an activity of in the arts or, or, or humanities in Ward Seven or Eight East of the River, uh, and uh, support the economic uh, eco creative economy located and east of the river. For the scope, uh, it is, I should also sort of talk about the ceiling. The ceiling for this grant, which means the ward amount is 35,000. Uh, and uh, the lowest amount funds that someone got in FY21 was 65% uh, of, the, of their ask. Uh, so we didn't get out any, any grant that was less than 22,300. Uh, so that was helpful because we want success. We we're trying to get that number of 65% up to 85% this year so that we want people to be successful when they get their funds uh, to do their activity. Uh, so if you have a, any, and here are some examples of some activities, it's dance, design, uh, literature, media arts, or any of those, activities in the arts and or humanities, uh, you should definitely uh, write for this grant activity, this grant program. And the, I would also say it was this program does not take a lot of work. Uh, it's open for it opens in May and it closes in June. We don't have the specific date uh, for that. Uh, that will be coming, but it'll open like usually around the middle of May. Uh, and it, it's open for four weeks. Uh, one month and it probably would take when i didn't work at the dc commission on the arts humanities i applied for this grant and it would take about a week uh, to complete this grant usually we just find that people start a little later in the process you have one year you can do programming anytime during the year you just outline in your grant uh specifics uh but you have until october 1st of 2022 to expend the grant funds Only little nuances are some eligibility, and I hear that uh, my other peers are talking about it today. Uh, is you have to be a nonprofit. Uh, you have to have your five hundred one c three for at least one year at the time of award. So by October first of twenty twenty one, you would have had to have your nonprofit status for one year. It doesn't need to be one year if you are applying uh, to get the funding. It could be at the month number uh, 
11 or month number 10, just by the time that we are awarding the grant. And the rest of the eligibilities are there outlined. However, we don't have currently, we don't have, you can't have a fiscal agent. Uh, so I did hear some talks about partnership. I wish we did have that, but right now we don't have a uh, fiscal agent. So there are three components uh, that we look at for the grant and, and uh, it's, it's worth sharing. They're pretty, for whatever you're talking about, whatever program it is, it's artistic content is 40%. Uh, and that's just about what you're doing, what the artistic content is. What is it, if it's design or, or if it's dance, uh, are there people that you we can see dancing, you do a work sample and it's a short little video. Uh, so you just display that content. The next criteria, I call it the 40, 30, 30. The next uh, criteria is financial capacity, management, sustainability, 30%. And when we look at all those capacity, I mean, those items there, I wouldn't say that, look that too much. We find out, I found, uh, and my EOR grantees, they can have, there could be a, the, the, the ED, uh, executive director is also uh, the vice president, is also the development person, is also the CFO, uh, and they will work with volunteers and, uh, and to make it happen. And they've been around, so there may be a one person running the major show of that, but they have a lot of volunteers and they've been around for 10, 20, 30 years. So it's just displaying and making sure you're talking about all those different things for sustainability that you're not an overnight uh, nonprofit. And the last 30% is that it is its impact and engagement uh, is towards seven and or eight uh, that you are providing support to our uh, residents uh, and that you are meeting the unique needs of the residents. And uh, here are some other grant programs that we have in our organization. Uh, and it's the first one, our Humanities Fellowship Program. That is for individuals, but anyone can apply for that. Uh, we have a curatorial grant, and you have the uh, limits there, 25,000. Uh, and the East of the River is what I was just talking about. Facilities and buildings, that grant can go up to uh, Whatever the funding is, I've seen that grant. We gave a, given a particular grantee seven hundred thousand last year for their facility and building. Uh, so, it, but that just depends on what we're funded, so that we just push our goals. A lot of people don't. That one takes probably that's the hardest grant to apply for because there's just a lot of paperwork in that one, and so forth. We have field trips, uh, public arts, and projects, events, and festivals, which is another one of a lot of my East of the River grantees uh, participate in is projects, events, and festivals because a lot of their East of the River programming can fit into that one. Sister Cities, Upstart is a capacity building grant, but that's for organizations over uh, 500,000. There is another one that we have for capacity building, uh, and it's called Liftoff. And that Liftoff one is for organizations under $500,000, uh, uh, and that's total budget. And that's the East of the River grant uh, that we have. Uh, are there any questions or I, I don't have access to the questions here if anyone has, but. Someone said, can you, up, can you elaborate on Upstart grants? Um, I know the director spoke to uh, a new and upcoming Nonprofits, and you all were doing some reorganization uh, within the DC Austin Managed Commission about supporting uh, more grassroots based organizations. Because I'm going to just be quite frank a lot of times when I see, uh, I received Austin Managed grants before, but I saw that a lot of times when I apply for grants, I didn't get those grants uh, because there were other organizations, uh, more wealthy. Uh, more fortified organizations who had grant writers, several of them applying for the grants, had the the matching funds, had money in their accounts, and I was competing, and I know others may feel this as well, competing for grants, and then when they got the grants, they were calling me because I had the relationships with the community they was getting grants to serve in to serve contract with them to do programming while they were getting the grants and pretty much keeping the money and giving me a little bit of money to do programs. And so how do smaller organizations get uh, access to these funding 
of uh, uh, these funds to support the work that they're doing when competing against larger, more bigger organizations? Uh, great question. Uh, so the first question I'm going to have tackle is the uh, Upstart grant. Upstart grant, uh, five hundred thousand dollars or more. It's a capacity building grant that you would they were you would work with a consultant uh, for uh, a year, and uh, you would also do an assessment with that consultant, and they will work with you if it's board development, resource development, financial an uh, analysis. Uh, I think there's six or five components to the Upstart grant. Uh, and after you do the assessment, they will chart out which ones are weak and they will work with you to find out which one we're going to tackle. And they, you all do that together. And that lasts a full. If you need more money, that, that one has a ceiling of 50000 Uh But typically, once you have done your assessment, they'll look at uh, how much they're going to give for that one. Uh, does these grants require funds? How does the organizations uh, I would no. This year we have aren't any uh, matching funds. Uh, so for the small organizations, you would just need to. I would say start with if you are in East of the River, start with the EOR grant. Uh, I'm going to also say you shouldn't be deterred or, or discouraged by saying that as you see a lot of organizations applying uh, for the grant. In my are about, we have a, there's only about two or three people who don't make the grant. So out of 30 people who apply, only two didn't get the grant. That uh, last year, out of uh, 33 have applied, only three didn't get the grant. So the chance of you getting a grant is the success rate is very high. And then you can get the funding. 65%, I should say, at least of this year that we did uh, for that. So don't be discouraged that they apply. And so start with the East of the River grant if you are in, in East of the River. Uh, and then I would say Project Events and Festival, we call that PEF, PEF. That's another that's a number two grant to start with, just to get your foot in the door wet and, and getting uh, acclimated to those. Can you put some of the information in the chat as well? Um, Absolutely. Questions in. Um, as it relates to where they get started, where to go. Absolutely. Um, there's also, it's a chat here, and there's also a question and answer feature on here that I see a lot of questions being asked as well. Glenn, if you can chime in with that as well. Council member, we do have um, questions from Facebook as well. Go ahead, Drew. Okay, uh, Mr. Randolph, I'll start with you since you just finished. Um, the question comes, um, how how many uplift grants go towards Ward 8? And uh, another one is, um, are the capacity building grants, are, th are there capacity building grants that pay rent and staffing? All right, the first question, how many Upstart grants go towards uh, Ward 8? Uh, this year we didn't have Upstart, but last year I think there were, there were only uh, six participants and upstart out of the six i want to say two were from one was from ward eight one was from ward seven so that we had two in east eor uh, and uh, the second part was that now lift off is a capacity building grant which i would find is more needed in ward eight uh because of the lower threshold and uh, out of the 25 grantees in lift off 13 of them came from ward eight and are there any grants, um, are there capacity building grants that pay for rent and staffing? No, there isn't. Okay. There is actually in our uh, facilities and buildings, there was a, F, uh, a FAB, FAB, facilities and buildings, that ran this year. And I think it's just open until this Friday. And I put in the chat uh, that was with uh, rent and mortgage relief. Got it. And then the final question is, can you elaborate on the PEF grant that you mentioned for um, residents outside of Ward 8? Yes. Uh, that's called Project Events and Festivals. So if you have a project, an event, or a festival that you are looking to put on, uh, you would fill out that application. So it, it, it could be actually as short as a festival, a one-day event, uh, or it could be a project uh, that's a little longer. Uh, 
that grant has a ceiling of twenty thousand dollars okay so these are going to be for um uh, you, Mr. Ogilvie, as well as you, Mr. Randolph, um, whoever chooses to ask. We have a lot of questions about startup. Um, you know, people want to know how much money do I need to start my nonprofit? Um, is there, is there, um, who can they contact to assist with completing the 501c3 application? I'll start with those two. So, so thank you, and, and I'll, I'll pop in and, and then pause. I also saw in the chat a lot of questions about starting a nonprofit. The question that I would ask as a part of the process and the question we should ask ourselves is pretty simple and it's why. Uh, why do you want to start an organization? And if the answer is to draw a salary, um, yeah, I want to quit my job, it's the wrong answer. It's definitely not sort of the gig work style, you know, turn on my phone for Uber when I have some time and turn it off when I'm not feeling like it. So why is the first thing that we want to answer? If it's about mission and supporting people in communities, you can do that without starting an organization. I think Councilmember White even shared how effective he was um, doing the work before having an organization. Uh, what I will also say that if you do your asset mapping and you find that there's no one else in the community doing what you are planning to do or that what you're doing is so very unique, then I would suggest a partnership and collaboration first with an entity that could use that program as a part of what they're operating uh, to get things done. So uh, if you really need to and you find that, um, how to start a nonprofit, we have on our site a very um, clear step-by-step -step guide. Uh, um, when you ask the question about you know, how much money you need, you need enough money that would allow you to focus on that nonprofit organization almost exclusively uh, because it will not surpass your day job uh, anytime soon. It will be a long time before it's able to allow you to focus on it and surpass your day job. So it would be savings um, so that you could focus on it and get it up and running strong enough that it will fit and meet that purpose uh, right up front. So I'll, I'll pause there and, and throw it back to uh, Mr. Randolph. Great. I'm. I'm actually because we have a. I have a few more. Then, let me interject real quick. Can you all hear me? Um. Uh, yeah. The, and one of the reasons why, because I, I was one of those people that said, you know, uh, I want to quit my job and do my nonprofit full time. And part of the reasons I already I started doing my nonprofit while I was still working my job, right? Until I started learning all the processes, and I worked at a nonprofit. Prior to starting my own, my own nonprofit, I learned the ins and outs and what it took to uh, make a network. I learned a long time ago you have to make friends, make a friend before you need a friend. And so by the time I launched my official nonprofit, I already had made a lot of these connections. And I thought that, you know, I could just do it on goodwill because a lot of people start off doing this work on goodwill. But I learned a long time ago it costs money to do ministry. And the more people, if I connect with JoJo, Working with Jojo. Jojo has a cousin named John. He has an uncle named Fred. He has a little sister named Tatiana. And it, then they all start coming to the program and they start bringing more people and the work continues to grow. Um, and so we do have to figure out a way that we can um, make provisions for your vision, right? Because there is a way that we can create an entity to get support um, to people who want to do work within the community because it's not just something that you want to do, but it's something that community needs. And that work has to be, it, it, it has to go beyond just goodwill, right? Because I used to come to the, come home tired and broke. And my wife was like, you know, the, the, the rent is due. And I'm like, well, I, I didn't get half of that money away before I even got in the house when I got paid, right? And so trying to encourage people to formalize that because you can't be an organization without being organized. A nonprofit is an official business. You have to run it like a business because I was in the community trying to do the work and trying to do the paperwork and doing the billing. I was the whole organization. And so I had to mature in the organization to get, as time progressed to build out where I can grow to get staff, uh, to get an office. That means file cabinets, that means a uh, fax machine, that means a computer. 
Uh, that man, uh, I had to get a grant writer. And to get the grant writer first, I didn't have the money to get a grant writer. So I told the grant writer at the time, if you going to write these grants. If we win the grants, you get paid. If you don't win this grant, you don't get paid. You know, I don't know if it's right or wrong, but that's the only solution I had. Um, and so we, I started there and continued to grow. Um, I think some of the information you all provided is very helpful. Um, and I know there are additional comments, questions in the comments in the question and answer section. I don't know if you all see that at the top of the screen. I see it. Um, the top of the question and answer, but that's just some of my philosophy around uh, being in a nonprofit field for so long um, and partnership. You know, if you find an organization that's in your lane doing what you're doing, figure out a way you can support them in their vision. You know, because sometimes nonprofits clash because you want your name on it, you want to be the person they go to, but it's it's about how can you collaboratively work together to accomplish the same mission. Um, and I and I was one of the organizations who got a grant from Fossil Peace. I think at the time it was um, a mini grant, three thousand dollars, and because I was responsible fiscally with three thousand, I ended up getting five thousand, right? Mm -hmm. And I ended up getting a grant that was six thousand, and so on and so forth, but. Like one of the things Dion said, when you get the money, do what you said you want to do with the money. So some people get the money and they start doing a lot of other crazy stuff. And then you know the FBI be in your line, you've been handcuffed. So be responsible uh, with the money. Uh, can you go to some of the questions, Glenn? I'm not sure if Manon jumped in yet, but you can go to some of the questions and yep. some, some of those questions audibly. Absolutely. Um, powerful points um, from you. Thank you very much. And, and your, your computer is extremely low. Is mine low? How about that? I, I, well, I can hear it fine. I think it might be the counter okay. computer. Um, okay, great. I'm not that. I was going to say not. <laughs> I was going to say before you so, take um, this, Sorry, Glenn, before you take those, please. I know I've had these two questions waiting in Facebook for a while, and I want to make sure to get them in before it's gone. And these are specifically to you. Sure. Um, one, do you help with business plans, and um, what are your service fees? Sure, thank you for that. So we offer a large number of classes per year. You reminded me of something else I saw in the chat as well. So there are about 100 capacity building classes that we offer. So maybe three times per week. And all of those are on our website. Um, some of those are around business planning, building and developing fundraising plans. It's about measures and outcomes, all of the core competencies you need to run a strong organization. Center, there was a really direct question, which I appreciate. Let's get right to it. And it's do we waive uh, dues? You pay member dues to be a member of the association. And while we don't waive them, we discount them severely with funds we've been able to raise. Conversation with anyone who's interested in at a subsidized amount to get the organizations involved. We do provide scholarships to all of those courses you see. Lots of scholarships happening there, and we are doing a core number of things, um, specifically for Ward 8. Um, my good friend and colleague, Dion, um, brought that up, and whatever she tells me to do, I do. Uh, so we're going to do some some pieces there, and I like what we have in the chat because that's uh, the course topics that we will cover um, over a period of time. So I hope I covered all of it. Um, fees can be reduced. Don't let that discourage you. Uh, we offer tons of scholarships. If you see courses that you're interested in, please, interested in, please make that be known and look forward to a, a core um, sort of panel of no cost courses to occur specifically for organizations uh, east of the river. That's awesome. I have one last thing, and this touches what the council member was just talking about um, in terms of partnership. And so what, what strategies do you suggest, and maybe council member, you want to chime in on this as well. What strategies do you suggest to partner with established nonprofits to build your brand? Yeah, um, so I'll start. Um, and I, I would say first, start small and look for ways to partner that don't involve money. Again, we want to sort of build our strength. So start small. And it is proposing to that organization the work that you are able to do and proposing to do a pilot of that work in the community or uh, helping that organization to go beyond the community they serve and do a pilot in your community of, of work that is co-branded with their name, um, your program's name, so start small. 
The other thing that's important is to have detailed agreements, uh, no handshakes, uh, an agreement that says, here's what I'm going to do, here's what you're going to do, and here is how we're going to report out and document um, what we've done together. So detailed agreements, we're both going to sign on the line and we're going to execute and, and see how that went. Uh, the final thing that I would suggest is look for multi-year plans or opportunities to partner together over a period of time. Uh, and do what you said you were going to do. If both parties do that, you're starting to build trust, and before you know it, you're raising money together or trusting them to be the fiscal sponsor of yours. Uh, so I'll stop uh, there. Thank you. That is um, all the questions I have right now for Facebook, um, but thank you very much. That was very informative. Thank you. Ms. Lockridge, did you want to give questions from the chat? Sure. Um, there was one question earlier. Let me just go back and see if I can locate it. You may oh, have asked the question already. I do have one that's real quick while you're looking for that. Do you know if okay, there is free great. web hosting, um, and this can go for anyone, if there's free web hosting for individuals running a nonprofit? So I, I haven't come across free web hosting, but I've come across a few uh, entities that have low cost um, hosting fees. What I will say is that a, a web presence being my own word, Googleable, is important because so many donors tend to see where you are before they make their decision. So it could be a web page until it becomes a website, but finding a way to have a presence. Social media has also taken us by storm and some people go to social media first uh, to look up and see how organizations are operating so you can start there and have handles that have the name of the organization and we know that that's no cost and you can drive people there when they want more information and then ultimately um, looking for ways where you can in a relationship as i mentioned earlier uh, have a link to your program that shares on the website of the organization you're partnering with that shares in greater detail um, what you do, why you do it, how you do it, and the outcomes that you're able to realize. Okay, there are a couple questions in the chat. One is, I found a leader united nonprofit organization and have been paying for programs, job readiness, health wellness, youth trips, et cetera, out of pocket with a few donations from donors. How can we get funding for a building and salaries for staff and instructors? I'm tracking that. Um, so uh, paying out of pocket to get things done. Uh, you need a pilot, and it sounds like it's already occurred out of pocket, to measure and demonstrate the, the depth and breadth of the organization. So you want some outcomes that you can speak to that can help you to get that first large grant or to convince more individuals about the work. Um, you also want uh, the people that you are serving to be able to share that and to be connected with their parents and families. Councilmember White touched on this. There are more family members. There's a ripple effect. There's church families. Get the word out about what you're doing and how others can be involved, how they can volunteer, how they can give some of their talent if they are that accountant or that legal person that can help your organization, and also some of their treasure. What would you do with $100? It may seem small, but when you're getting a $100 donation, from six or 700 people over time, and each of those donations are growing to a thousand. Now you're really building your individual donor base. Uh, so you've already started, you have some outcomes, package those, be able to tell the story in a short form and begin getting the word out and telling people what they can do to support the work. Let's take a couple more before we turn it back over to the council member. Any tips for writing a grant for the first time with no assistance from anyone that has grant writing experience? I see my, my good friend, Manon <laughs> Um I think she's muted, however, so hopefully she can get some points in here as well. Um, so writing a grant for the first time, um, it's helpful to take a look at an award-winning grant that someone else may have had to give you a bit of a framework for how you express um, the, the impact of your organization. Look at that common grant application. I find it to be very helpful because it asks the same probing questions that just about every funder would. And think about how to tell that story. I like to tell um, 
people that when you're writing it for the first time and it says, what is your history, mission and vision? And people say, well, there is no history because I'm just getting started. You are the history. The reason that you have taken it on, um, created this mission and started this work, tell that story and that too can be the first break uh, to getting things done. I'm gonna, I'm gonna point um, as well for some of this to, to Mr. Randolph, as I know he reviews quite a bit um, and maybe he can share some of the things that have been most compelling uh, to allow him to actually fund organizations. Thank you, Glenn. Uh, so, the DC Commission of the Arts Humanities, if you can get your grant in one week before it's due, then we will review the grant manager. I will read over your uh, grant and then make suggestions. Uh, they could just be what we believe the panel would focus on. So just, or the story may be choppy and we would just try to help you with that. But we will give you a, a good hour, one-on-one uh, -on -one time, uh, before your grant is submitted. So that's a good, that's a good avenue, a good focus to say, do it a week before, don't procrastinate or wait to, too close to the deadline. Uh, and the most compelling, One last question. I thank you so much. Back over to the council member. Where will the recording of this presentation be housed and how can we access it later? So immediately after the meeting, it will be up on Facebook and tomorrow it will be uploaded onto YouTube. Council member White. We love, let's say we love Manai. Manai, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear. Okay, great. There you are. Thank you so much. Great. Wonderful. Good evening, everyone. And thank you, Council Member White and team for the opportunity to serve in this capacity by providing, hopefully, some very valuable information to our um, phenomenal nonprofit leaders and to those who are currently serving the great Ward 8 in various capacities. Um, I just want to have a little modified presentation to address some of the issues that we are talking about. And this portion of the presentation is what I call running the race. And so for me, nonprofits, specifically the leaders, you need to be ready to tell your story. And sometimes, especially when I was working in a foundation and you talk or you meet with people, struggling to articulate, and I'm not saying that you need to be a profound speaker, but being very clear in your talking points about who you are as the founder of the organization, why you created the organization, what need are you trying to fulfill, and more importantly, what solution are you offering? And so as you write proposals, even before you even begin that process, especially for young nonprofit organizations, be ready to tell your story, be ready for your pitch and review it with several people. And let's be clear, as you evolve, as the needs of the community evolve, as the needs of your populations evolve, so will your story. And you need to be ready for that. So if you are a nonprofit um, leader and you've been in existence for 10 or 15 years, the community has changed. The individuals that you serve may have changed. There have, may have been some new needs that have shed light. Depending on who you are and what you do, it may have been the same as it was 10 or 15 years ago. But then you also need to be mindful then of what the funding and philanthropic community looks like. What are some of those needs? So be very clear to address the specific problems with con create solutions. And let me be very clear with some nonprofit organizations. If you're running an after school program, do not stress yourself by trying to meet the outcome of a funder that wants you to be very clear about what are you doing for academic achievement or enrichment. If you are providing a safe space for children after school with a few enrichment activities, 
you are not in academic enrichment. You are a safe haven. Now, if you're bringing somebody in who specializes in a tutorial service or providing some type of re uh, reading enrichment, then that's a great partnership that you leverage. And there's already been discussion about mission creep, so I'm not going to go into that any further. Um, the next thing that I want to talk about is eliminate buzzwords and jargon. Um, sometimes people are using words that make no sense in application. Uh, and it's not impressive. And sometimes it just makes you look out of touch with who you are and what you're doing in the space that you're doing it in. We've talked about budgets excessively, but I want to be very clear about this. And I applaud those who are running nonprofit organizations using their own funds or using funds that they have secured from other places. And let's be very clear. There are some very creative ways that people are raising money. Um, there are new tools, new online platforms that individuals can use to help secure funds. And no donation is too small. Again, what you also want to make sure of as you're raising money is that first of all, you're in a position to legally fund rates. If you are soliciting funds in the District of Columbia, you actually need to have a charitable solicitation license. So again, be very careful for how you're asking for money, who you're asking money from, and make sure that you are licensed to do that. So as you prepare your budgets, you really want to think about all of your expenses. And as you're starting out, a ream of paper is a line item expense. Anything that you're doing to run your organization or program is an expense. And you need to be clear about knowing what it costs to actually operate your nonprofit, but then what is the associated cost as it relates to serving the population or doing whatever work that you're doing as it relates to your nonprofit organization. And be clear about the budget. Be clear about what your actual expenses are and then what are the variances. And be clear about then what is your narrative around why those variances. It could be a timing issue. It could be that you no longer have a specific programmatic activity. It could be that you lost funding or that you gained funding. Be very clear because your budget also tells a story of the necessity as to why you're doing the work that you're doing within the community. What I also want to be clear about is that as you go out here and apply for funding, please do your work. So go and research. And I have to agree with my colleague when he talked about these deadlines. One of the hardest things as a program officer is when you get calls at 4.30 for a five o'clock application closing deadline and people are having technical difficulties. They're just entering in the system. They're just logging on. They're just creating a, a user account. It is imperative that you actually plan applying for whatever funding opportunity is available. It is important that you stage it. And one of the things that we've talked about in terms of best practices is that at least a week prior to the grant being due, you've already created an online account or whatever grant portal that funder is using, that you familiarize yourself, that you have some sense of knowing and understanding what is the content that is being asked for your grant proposal and that you prepare that in advance. Last week, there were a lot of questions about grant writers. What I have said to nonprofit leaders, I think grant writers are very important, but they can't help you if you are not in a position to tell your story. If you're not able to give concrete examples of the work that you've done, the individuals that you have served, they are a guide to you. And so it's very important that you read that application before it's submitted. There were very ca various cases with me where I had individuals who had never even read the proposal and did not have a clue to what was included in that proposal. So own your proposals. Your proposal is the portfolio telling the story of who you are as an organization. And you never know when someone is gonna offer you an opportunity to fund you. And so you need to be ready to articulate and define who you are. The sprint to the finish line. Research the information on the funder prior to submitting your grant application. Refrain from including information that is not requested by the funder. 
funders and philanthropy are getting a lot more strategic now about the information that they are asking for and being very clear about the rubric and the methodology in terms of scoring applications. Extraneous information, that means information that the funder did not request, basically is going to be a ding against you. Again, a lot of times you're using volunteers and you do not want to have individuals who are volunteering their time to be reading information that does not pertain to the application at hand. Again, be concise, answer the specific questions that are asked, and pay attention to the technical requirements. Know your EIN number, make sure the right email address is there. If they're requiring any licensing information, make sure that's included, and make sure that you follow the character limitations. We talked about this earlier, and I think I mentioned it last week, outcome and output, impact assessment. Be very clear about what you are doing and what your benefit is to the public. Remember, a nonprofit is a business, but it's a business that serves the public. How is your population being helped? How is the community best being served? Who are you serving? How are you serving? Who are the number of individuals that you are serving? How are people's lives better? Because you actually exist. This is what is appealing to funders, that again, you are part of the solution. And a lot of times we worry about being a solution, the solution. What are you doing to help people move on the next rung? That's what we want to be clear about at the end of the day. Again, Glenn kind of talked about this. I'm not going to go into this, but there are some who are using this common grant application. I encourage all new organizations to at least complete a common grant application, just to have in your files, just to have as a part of your corporate documentation so that if the need arises, you already have it. And last but not least, do not assume that the reviewer or the program officer knows or understands your organization, your program, your organization's impact or your target populations. In other words, last but not least, it's your job to tell your story. Good luck to all of you out there. Be ready to receive. And again, thank you for all the work that you do, your tireless efforts to serve the best interests and the best needs of the great Ward 8. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Hi, Manon. I don't have any from Facebook, but I did not realize that was you in the Facebook chat. So I apologize and thank you. <laughs> So I will allow you to serve, continue to serve in the comments um, as you were earlier today. And if you can go back into the comments and um, just put in your information for people to reach you, I think that'd be helpful. Absolutely. And I'm happy to provide that. I currently serve as the operations manager for the Jan Van Croft Robinson Foundation, which for the last 10 years since its existence has been providing um, funding to organizations serving the East of the River Ward 7 and 8 communities around social determinants of health. We are now working on a new strategic framework as it relates to our grant making. However, it will still be based um, East of the River. We're just not clear yet on what that would look like, but it will be around cancer patient navigation and perhaps workforce development. So I will put my contact information um, in the chat. Thank you so much. Thank you, Manon. I'm going to ask if you all can answer some of the questions in the question and answer uh, chat as we begin to wrap up. Um, I do want to um, encourage you guys to join us in some of the upcoming hearings. I'm going to pull that up. Um, we have a nonprofit incubator bill that is out. We will be reintroducing on the city council. Um, we're going to ask that you uh, chime in on that at the hearings coming up we have a lot of hearings coming up we want you all to be focused on the budget hearings um one is for serve dc um on eight on march the first um we have another budget hearing on april the 19th and we have an arts and humanities hearing on april the 7th all this information will be sent out through the trayon white eight.com um, uh, those who subscribe, we send, we're going to send that out to those, this, uh, 
call so you can know when the hearings are. We want to ask that you send a profile of who you are in your organization to myself and to the other members um, on the D.C. City Council and to the mayor so you can get your message out of who you are and what you represent. And we just ask for one pager from everybody um, at this upcoming hearing. So there is a bill that will be reintroduced, um, which is a nonprofit incubator bill um, that be coming through the council, you'll get more information about it, but we need support on that bill because it has to be funded. For those who don't know, if a bill has a fiscal impact and does not get funded, the bill dies. And so we have to reintroduce it so it can get funded so we can get the, the money uh, to the community uh, to to uh, fund these different initiatives. And I don't want you to misconfuse what I'm saying. We're not saying be dependent all upon the DC city government because the, the council members change. The, the mayor's changed, the priorities changed, and the people don't. And so we want you to diversify your funding and stick to your core mission and vision and values so you can serve those residents who you created your nonprofit to serve. I see Wanda is putting the list of the council members uh, in the chat. Uh, we're also going to send you guys a, a, a fish you, uh uh, the official bills, you can see what it is, read through it and, and see if there's something you want to support uh, so you can um, chime in. We have to advocate for ourselves. Uh, I always say that the population needs the resource the most, advocate the least. And so we have to change that narrative and push past the conversation of equality and start talking about equity in our community. And this goes beyond just money for nonprofits. We talk about clean streets. We talk about uh, grocery stores. We talk about um, uh, um, we're talking about access to quality programs in, in schools, after school programs. We're talking about services for our seniors. We're talking about uh, just. I see someone eggs. I get those dates again for those hearings. Um, serve DC hearing is March the 1st. Um, we have a Serve DC hearing on April the 19th. We have an Arts Humanities hearing on April the 7th. All these are virtual, which you can sign up. The quicker you sign up, the, uh, the, the, the quicker you testify during that day. Uh, we need to hear from people in the war. Um, war 8, I know I'm in War 8, but also War 7 as well. Um, and we welcome people from across the city as well, but we know that we have a lot of um, social needs in our community. We have a lot of people who want to do good and want to fulfill those needs, but just don't have the access to build those organizations to be fully functional. So we want to help you do just that. Um, put the date in the chat, got it. Um, I see... Are you all, are you all chiming into the chat? Okay, we got to wrap up soon. I'm sorry. Um, Council member, can I just encourage people to join your mailing list? If you go to Trayon White, the number eight dot com, there is a link at the bottom of the page that says sign up for newsletter. We will be sending out all the links and information from this meeting um, in an e-blast. So if you want to get the information and you want to know more and you didn't get opportunity to write everything down, whatever you missed will be in that newsletter that comes out weekly. So Trayon White, the number eight dot com. And down at the bottom of the page, it's a link that says sign up for the newsletter. And I've dropped that link um, in the chat on Facebook and I'll do so in the chat here now. All right, guys, I hope this conversation was beneficial. Um, I always say that the blessing is in your follow-up. You can get a lot of information um, and be very, uh, you know, inspired. But if you do nothing with it, those lives you will build to impact uh, are affected by you being proactive or you being reactive. And so be proactive. Uh, get out and make it happen. No one is going to fulfill your vision that God gave you to do but you. Um, but you have to collaborate and learn and glean from people that he puts in your path and in your way. So uh, all the ups and downs build character. And so we want to support you as you support yourself in the community. Uh, again, my name is Treyon White. I'm honored to serve as a council member of the great Ward 8. Uh, don't just stand there. Do something. Don't forget to leave your name, 
your organization, your email, your contact information in the chat. We're going to gather this information and send emails to you guys as a follow-up conversation so we can uh, have a working document and get these goals that we are creating within this chat. Uh, this chat will be copied and downloaded and sent back out um, with the answers to some of the questions in this chat as well. Uh, thank you all. We have plan on getting off at 9 o'clock. It's 9-12. Uh, we're going to give a in here and then Facebook. Um, share this information with a friend, a family member you know is looking to uh, get involved and get active in their community. Um, it'll be a blessing to those in our community. Don't just stand there. Do something. Thank you. God bless and have a good night.